I was invited to deliver a presentation on using product design to enhance your tabletop game to Spieler Ortrundsunft, or SAS, the Game Designers Association. SAS was founded 30 years ago to recognise the interests of game designers in their interactions with publishers and with the public. And the association boasts 500 members spread across the globe with its main area of activity in Germany. This video is a repeat of the presentation that I gave, and it basically serves as a summary of all the product design videos that I've made. So if you've watched a lot of my videos, you won't find much new here. And if you've watched my recent videos about hooks and player types, then you might want to jump ahead a little bit. I'll put timestamps below. But if you're new to the channel, this is a nice introduction to the topics I've discussed in a lot more detail over the last few years. I'll put some links in the description below if you fancy following up on any of the topics discussed. I'm Adam Porter, I'm a board game inventor from Cardiff in Wales, and these are my published games to date, though I have others on the way with various publishers. I've been running my YouTube channel, Adam in Wales, since 2013, and over recent years the focus has moved to primarily talking about board game design. I put a heavy focus on product design in these videos, and I massively increased the output on my channel in 2021, producing weekly videos. I was hugely honoured to be included in Mojo Nation's list of the 100 most influential figures working in toy and game design, and also to be highlighted by Cardboard Edison as producing the best videos for board game design in 2021. Mojo Nation and Cardboard Edison are two of the best online resources I've found for board game design articles, news and information. I'm a relative newcomer to game design. My first games were released in 2017, and I still have a day job outside of board games. My game Picoco was the first game which alerted me to the power of product design in games. It's a trick-taking game where you can't see your own cards, and it won some awards. But the thing that really surprised me was that it attracted the attention of toy makers. I was invited to pitch to Hasbro, to speak on a panel about game design at a conference of mass market publishers, and to speak to product design students at a university. And the weird thing is, I really don't think any of those people had actually played the game. The presentation was everything, and that was an accident. Over the years, I've attended hundreds of game design meetups and events, and I've played many, many prototypes. And it's clear to me that most designers start their process in one of two ways. Inspiration or experimentation? When I come up with a game, sometimes it's when I'm in the shower, or when I'm driving to work, or when I'm awake in the early hours of the morning, or, or walking the dog. Ideas land in my mind, uninvited, and I just can't shake them. But I've also taken a more procedural approach, experimenting with subverting existing mechanisms, fixing a broken game, or simplifying a complex game, or mashing two games together to create something unique. And inspiration and experimentation are both really creative, rewarding ways to create games. But the problem is, commercially speaking, they're a shot in the dark. If you want to create a successful product, that's far more likely if you start with empathy, putting yourself in your customer's shoes right from the start of the process. So that means spending time with gamers, online and offline, talking to them, watching them play, and finding out what they're searching for. Your job is to find that, make it, and then test it. And this is the basis of what's known as design thinking. It's a five-step process used by product designers. You start off by trying to understand your audience, you establish what problems they face, then you ideate solutions, build a prototype, and then you start testing. And this isn't a linear process. You might go back and forth between these different stages, or you might approach them in a totally different order. I recently watched an interview with the world's most prolific board game designer, Rainer Knizia, where he said that design thinking was common sense. And I agree with him that it's sensible, but I'm not sure that it's common. My feeling is that the first two steps often get missed. Designers become inspired or they start experimenting without ever really thinking about their audience. And the result is that many games get created which nobody actually wants or needs. And these are the topics that we're going to cover in this video. All of these are covered in more depth in other videos on this channel. But we're going to start with understanding our audience. There's no right way to play games. People enjoy different games in this hobby for very different reasons. But who are your core audience? What do they value? 
I've put together a very loose, unscientific classification of tabletop gamers. You could think of these as avatars of the people who play your games, and I'd encourage you to come up with your own classification. My system is based on an old model of personality types, but I've adapted it for our needs. I'm proposing that some players are introverts and some are extroverts. And of course these are rather simplistic labels. I guess I really mean players who like low interaction games and players who like games with lots of interaction. But there are many people in between. And some people like to be really analytical when they play games, while others are just in it for the thrills. And this creates a spectrum with four different classes of players. And I'm calling these players druids, fighters, rogues and bards. The druids are introverted analysts. They favour low interaction games with low levels of chance and lots of opportunity for calculation, organisation and resource management. The fighters are extroverted analysts. They favour a high degree of interaction, but they still seek out strategic play and intellectually challenging gameplay. Fighters want games which can be won based on skill rather than luck but they're accepting of the chaotic nature of interactive play. Attacking your opponent while defending your own resources is fun for fighters. Rogues are extroverted thrill seekers. They prioritise interaction and the experience of the game over developing strategies. Rogues are very forgiving of luck-based play and take that mechanisms. They prefer to think on the fly and adapt to the cards they have in hand. The most important thing for a rogue is that everybody is laughing, and ideally that they're at the centre of the experience and getting noticed. A bard is an introverted thrill-seeker. They're all about the experience, but they would rather go it alone. Solo games and cooperative games appeal to bards, so long as they tell a strong story. Bards are forgiving of luck in their games. They would prefer to face off against a random card draw than a human opponent. A matrix is not a prison cell. Just because you're a rogue, it doesn't mean you couldn't enjoy a game of chess or Splendor or Puerto Rico from time to time. The classification is broad and imprecise, but I do think that creating avatars can help us to focus our designs. If you struggle to identify which class your game might appeal to, perhaps it has features of three or four classes, you might struggle to find your audience. Luck-based play could be really jarring in an otherwise very cerebral, lengthy strategy game. And likewise, slow, solitary calculations have no place in a party game. It's better to identify a small audience. Remember, each of these classes actually contains a pretty sizeable number of individuals, and the goal should be to excel in your particular niche rather than trying to please everyone and failing to please anyone. So designers, do you have a picture in your head of who's going to be playing your game? Have you got that image in your head? Well, what do they want? How do they look when they're fully engaged in the game? Are they smiling? Are they laughing? Are they negotiating? Or are they scratching their head? Well, your job is to make that happen. Once we've understood our audience, we then need to consider what problems we can help them with. Since board games are inherently luxury items, identifying a problem can be a challenge. It's not as easy as saying, well, people need to be able to reach the highest points in their house and then inventing a collapsible ladder. I mean, nobody genuinely needs a board game. So our definition of problem needs to be a little bit more nuanced. And this is the point in the process where game designers start to consider hooks. A hook is a feature which draws people in, piques their interest and motivates them to stick around to learn more. So a novelist might start their tale with a particularly shocking passage, an outrageous event to be unpicked later, an insurmountable challenge for the principal character which readers will then will them to overcome. A hook could even be a single sentence which captures the overarching theme of the book. When pitching a screenplay for a television or film project, the hook is pivotal. It needs to be describable in one or two sentences, and it must be gripping. In music, a hook has a similar function, to quickly catch the attention of a listener. But strong hooks also have another quality. They're memorable. They stick around in your head. You find yourself humming the tune in the shower or on your drive to work. A strong melodic hook can become an earworm. Games work a little bit differently from novels or films or music in that they're interactive. A player doesn't passively consume media. They don't sit back and watch a narrative unfold. They create that narrative. And this broadens what a hook can be. A hook for a board game could be thematic or mechanical or physical or contextual. 
So a thematic hook for a game is really plain to see. I mean, why did I purchase Ravensburger's Jaws game? As fun as the hidden movement, one versus all gameplay is, that's not the draw for me. The appeal was the nostalgia for the film. I was keen to immerse myself in that story, to relive some of my childhood memories in a new format. A mechanical hook can be a little bit harder to describe. Remember, a great hook only takes a sentence or two to put across. But Quarto is a game with an incredible mechanical hook. When it's your turn, your opponent chooses which piece you play. Simple, clear, and yet it subverts everything we know about how board games are supposed to work. The more complex a game gets, the harder it is to put across its mechanical hook. A physical hook is the closest to what we might refer to as a gimmick. Though the word gimmick is a pejorative, and I don't consider a strong physical hook cynical or superficial. I mean, think of the vertical playing board in Connect 4, or the pyramid dice shaker in Camel Up, or the bird box dice tower in Wingspan. A strong visual and tactile presence really helps players to engage. And a contextual hook encompasses everything else. But often it relates to the reputation of a game or a game maker. So Libertalia was a very popular game back in 2012, but it soon went out of print and for several years players were unable to get their own copy. As time passed, the game became more and more desirable. We always want what we can't have. So Stonemaier tapped into this increased demand with a new version of the game with a reimagined setting, reworked rule set, and really attractive components. If we look at our avatars, which type of hook is going to appeal to which type of gamer? Well, analytical gamers, so that's the druids and fighters, they respond to mechanical hooks. And the difficulty is that they also tend towards more complex gameplay where that mechanical hook could be hard to describe in a pithy phrase. So often the hook in these games ends up being contextual. Druids and fighters might follow specific designers, Shem Phillips, Stefan Feld, Vital Lacerda, Eric Lang, and pick up the latest game from that designer based on reputation alone. Bards and rogues are more likely to respond to thematic hooks. The story is important. And rogues are sociable. They want a wild, invigorating time. So they might enjoy a more experiential slant, a theme or setting which makes them feel naughty or mischievous. Rogues welcome chaos and big moments. So a physical hook or perhaps a dexterity element might be attractive to some gamers in this class. Product onboarding is the process by which a user moves from being unaware of the product to a fully engaged user. It's a term commonly used in digital products to describe someone signing up to a service, using it for the first time, and understanding the value offered by that product. And in relation to board games, the onboarding process starts with the user's first interactions with the game. So that's picking it up off the store shelf, watching a video review, opening the box for the first time, sorting the components, reading the rules, teaching the game, playing it for the first time, packing it away and returning it to the shelf. But it might also include a range of online interactions with rules forums, reviews, how to play videos and discussions. With many digital products, Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, we know that many people sign up for an account and never go on to fully utilise those services. An empty profile is of no value to those businesses. They need active users to drive ad revenue. But in board games, things are a little bit different. If a game's already been purchased, the publishers made their money. So why should they care what happens next? Well, it's another matrix. And this time we're looking at engagement. We know that this hobby is made up of millions of game players, but there are also a sizable number of game collectors. So I own around 500 games, and I would estimate that 10% of these are unplayed, and only half of them have been played more than three times. In the left-hand section of the matrix, we have the collectors. And ultimately, it doesn't make much difference to the publisher whether the collector is engaged or not with the product. The game is going to sit on their shelf regardless, and it's unlikely to be introduced to new players. The sale is a dead end, though if the collector is engaged with the idea of the game, they might go on to buy expansions or sequels. On the right-hand section of the matrix, we have the purchasers who bought the game with the realistic intention of playing it. If the onboarding process presents them with many hurdles, they might never get as far as actually playing the game though. Maybe they struggle to interpret one particularly tricky rule and the game is put on the shelf to revisit at a later time and that time never arrives. Cynical gamers often refer to their unplayed games as their shelf of shame. Collectors 
they sometimes put a positive spin on this. They term it a shelf of opportunity. But for a publisher, it could be termed a shelf of missed opportunity. Further into the lower right hand corner, we have players who have experienced the game and are actively disengaging, usually because they didn't enjoy the experience. This is where the social nature of board gaming can present a challenge to publishers. A dissatisfied gamer can become a detractor. They share their experience in person and online and the reputation of the game is damaged. The top right corner is the area where publishers and designers should focus their attention. Engaging a player can create a fan, somebody who'll go on to buy expansions, sequels, and even other games from the same designer or publisher. If they're really satisfied, they might even go on to become a brand advocate, an evangelist for your product. The good news for publishers and designers is that brand advocates are everywhere in board gaming. So how do we ensure that our players are engaged with our product? Well, Stephen Rice was an American psychologist who published a study in the year 2000 where he surveyed 6,000 individuals across four continents and identified 16 basic human desires. He concluded that these 16 desires motivate all our behaviours and actions, and most of these desires are partially satisfied by playing board games. It would be a stretch to suggest that board games can fulfil our desire to eat, and neither can I genuinely claim that board games are particularly conducive to sex and romance, though Bruno Fiduti's Karma Sutra game has a really good stab at it, and I'm sure Hasbro's Twister is occasionally played with less family-friendly house rules. I've tried to break down the elements of gameplay which make me personally engage with a game, and this is what I've come up with in no particular order. So I've put together a ladder system to analyse games for engagement. And remember, this is designed to my own specific tastes. It's what I want from a game. So each game is scored between 0 and 3 in five different categories, and depending on its score, it will climb that many rungs on the ladder. And you'll notice that the ladder only has 10 rungs, so you don't need a perfect score to get to the top of that ladder. You just need to excel in a few different areas. So let's look at some examples. Quacks of Quedlinburg is engaging because it's stressful, and it gives constant rewards to the players, constant feedback. This more than makes up for the lack of interaction and the weak theming in the game. Dobble is likewise very stressful, and it gives immediate feedback to players, but it's more interactive than Quacks. There aren't any choices in the game, but that doesn't really matter because it excels in other areas. And the closest I've found to a total all-rounder is Rudiger Dorn's Las Vegas. Now this one doesn't excel in any one area, but it's solid in all of them. And that's enough to climb to the top of the ladder. But it doesn't matter how good your gameplay is if the customer never gets that far. So a poor rulebook, or fiddly components, or poor artwork, or unmet expectations could prevent a player ever finding out the brilliance of your game idea. So let's think about that player experience from first seeing your game, through their initial plays, and beyond. This is a customer journey map. It's something you might want to consider when playtesting your game. You can include all sorts of different events on that map, and consider the changing moods which players experience once they've purchased your game. In this initial section, we're looking at the user experience, or UX, before the first game. So I would guess that for most players, after the excitement of purchase, learning the rules, is a real mood killer. And then we have the experience of playing that first game. How fun is your own turn? But just as importantly, is it still fun when the other players take their turn? How brutal is the game? Does it feel harsh to be attacked? And how fun is winning? But equally, is it painful if you lose the game? Finally, we have the user experience after the game. How hard is it to put everything away? And are players inclined to discuss the game and plan future strategies? Or even better, just start playing all over again. We can go a step further with these maps and start to note down the player's thoughts and fears and questions at each stage of the process. This is all about putting yourself in your customer's shoes, and it might help you to identify some problem areas that you need to address in your game design. We can chart these problem areas as pain points. If learning rules is a problem, how could you help the players with that? I mean, wouldn't that be a great hook the game where you never had to learn the rules. If players hate losing your game, how can you cushion the blow or make it less brutal? Or even better, here's another hook. The game where losing is fun. Board game designers value their ideas really highly, and the most frequent question I get asked from new designers is how do I protect my idea? 
But that question lays bare a big misunderstanding about the board game industry. The truth is that ideas are everywhere. Board game publishers are overwhelmed with designers pitching ideas. The key to a successful product is the execution. This formula puts the quality of an idea on one axis and the execution of that idea on the other. To have a lucrative product, you need to be in the warmer colours, red, orange, yellow. A red title would be a massive hit, a genius idea masterfully executed, and games like this become perennial bestsellers. A solid release, a game which might turn a small profit, that could be in the yellow or green section. This is where the good ideas are, with decent execution, and they languish with mediocre sales. A disappointing product, a game in the blue section, might break even, or maybe even make a loss. So what do I mean when I say idea? Well, essentially we're talking about the core gameplay concept, the hook, the solution that you've imagined to deal with a problem that you've identified. And what do we mean when we say execution? Well, that's everything else. Aesthetics, reach, the ease of the rules, accessibility, cost of manufacture, marketing, etc. There's an analogy often quoted by marketing professionals regarding Super Mario and his Fire Flower. It's so widely quoted I can't locate an original source, but the analogy goes something like this. Imagine Mario is our customer, and we're going to try and sell a product, the Fire Flower. The mistake many companies make is that they focus on promoting the Fire Flower. They focus on the appearance of it, the features, the way that it functions. But here's where the focus of the marketing really should be. To paraphrase, customers don't purchase products, they purchase a better version of themselves. The promise established by the outward presentation of our product should make clear the incredible experience offered by the product, the way it's going to make you feel, and the problems it's going to help you overcome. Mario doesn't care about the fire flower, but he might care about what it could help him to achieve. In commercial terms, Monopoly is one of the greatest board game products in existence and its success is largely related to its long history and its wealth of familiar brand assets. Go to jail, free parking, do not pass go, community chest. But the game is extremely self-aware. Hasbro understands and values that brand. When players recall their experiences with the game, they'll tell anecdotes about stealing money from the bank or games that seem to go on forever. So take a look at these recent editions of the game. Hasbro is in on the joke. They're doubling down on your negative experiences and making them a selling point. And take a look at the promise in that Cheetah's edition. It's signalling very clearly how you're going to feel playing the game. Mr Monopoly's clenched fist is overflowing with stolen banknotes. He's shushing you, inviting you to join him in the criminal underworld. The cover text asks, what can you get away with? The promise is that you're going to get to feel naughty without any real-life consequences. It's telling that the Monopoly logo has changed over the years. Back in the 1980s, Mr Monopoly was looking into the middle distance with arms spread wide. In the noughties, he changed tack. He looked us straight in the eye and reached out, offering us a hand to welcome us into his world. In recent years, Mr Monopoly has taken a starring role on the cover of many editions. The assurance is clear. Play well and you'll get to be like rich Uncle Pennybags with his bulging sacks of cash. One of the most common bits of advice that I hear from publishers and other game designers is that publishers are looking for original, innovative concepts, ideas which allow them to stand out above the thousands of other games released each year. The truth is, that most games which are considered to have popularised a certain genre were not actually the first game of that type. The true innovator is often forgotten. Catan started the new wave of strategic board games at the turn of the century. One of its big innovations was the randomised production of resources for all players based on a dice roll, a mechanism later used in Machikoro, Space Base and other games. But before Catan, there was Crude, the oil game, a less well-known title which appears to have been the first to have used that mechanism. If we look at card drafting, the process whereby players pick one card from their hand, then pass the rest to the next player at the table, thus amassing a selection of cards to score points. Well, Seven Wonders was produced in 2010, and for most gamers it will be the first card drafting game which springs to mind. Later, in 2013, Sushi Go took up the mantle. But neither of these games was the first. 
Fairy Tale was a card drafting game released in 2004, and of course pre-game drafting was already familiar to players of Magic the Gathering. One hugely popular mechanism in modern games is worker placement. On a player's turn they place a worker, a token, onto an action space and gain the reward, thereby blocking other players from taking the same action. Agricola was released in 2007 and is probably still the defining game in the genre, but Kalos brought the mechanism to the attention of gamers in 2005, and the invention of the mechanism is credited to Richard Brees in his 1998 game Keedom. So how many people own a copy of Keedom? Hanabi was heralded as a hugely innovative new game in 2010, and it went on to win the Spiel des Jahres. In this game you can't see your own cards and you have to deduce what cards you're holding based on the clues from the other players. This mechanism is implemented very effectively here, but the core concept was used in Alex Randolph's 1985 game Code 777, and that game credits Robert Abbott as co-designer because it was directly inspired by his 1963 game What's That On My Head? And of course, I was inspired by the mechanism for my game Picoco. The truth is that being innovative is not the key to standing out. It's more important to be distinctive, and this is achieved by having a good idea and executing it well. Unique experimental design serves to push forward an art form or a craft, but it doesn't always translate to commercial success. If an idea is too out there, it's going to be harder for a user to adopt. Consumers are looking for convenience, not products which create a burden or add stress into their lives. A slight twist on a familiar concept has fewer barriers for a new user. There's a reason that toys repeatedly utilise the same worlds – dinosaurs, trucks, fashion, roleplay. Yes, it's been done a million times before, but for each child this new product may be the first time they've encountered a toy from that world. You don't have to be the first, you just need to be the most prominent current iteration. And this is equally true in board games. The lifespan of most board games is one to two years before they essentially become a forgotten title, with the final copies being removed from the game stores. When a new hobby gamer encounters your worker placement game, it may be the first that they've ever experienced, and every other similar game which has gone before is irrelevant to that user. The way a product looks is one of the most important factors in determining whether a product gets purchased, and whether it's enjoyed by the purchaser once they start using it. Focusing in on board games, the visual appeal is massively important in determining commercial success. But it's a really tricky area for me to dive into, because unless a designer is self-publishing their game, they've got very little input into the presentation of the product. Generally the look of a game is determined by the publisher. But the most important thing is that designers need to understand what board games look like in 2022, and what players expect. You should have an idea of what your game could look like, even if you're not in a position to totally realise that vision without a publisher's help. Sometimes I've made mood boards to demonstrate to a publisher the rough direction that I could see for the artwork in my game. A mood board is a, a collage of images, photographs, colours, patterns and drawings. I might incorporate images from films, books, paintings, all which share a common feel with my game. You could think of it as a printed version of a Pinterest page. A great product grows with its user. As designers we've got a balance to achieve. We need to make sure that our game makes an outstanding first impression, but also ensure that it continues to surprise and delight with subsequent plays. And it's sensible to give some thought to expansion potential, but don't waste your time creating expansions before that base game is complete. You could also consider whether your game might work as a range of games. But again, don't get ahead of yourself. Publishers are going to want to see your base game prove itself before considering any sequels. And finally, if we're creating a product, we really need to ensure that it only has a positive impact. Inventors need to think about accessibility, respect, inclusion and sustainability. So accessibility in the sense of making your games playable by the widest possible audience, regardless of physical, mental, social or sensory differences. Respect in the sense of taking great care in your depiction of individuals, groups, cultures and traditions. Inclusion in terms of making your game relatable to all so that everybody feels welcome at the table. And sustainability in terms of a game's impact on the environment. So let's summarise. As a designer you need to understand your audience, devise a strong hook, make the onboarding as smooth as possible and engage your players. You might consider customer journey maps and try to identify pain points in your product. You need to make sure your game delivers on your promises. 
It's great if a new product is innovative, but iteration could be very effective too. Your product needs to grow with its users and you need to try and have a positive impact on your players, on communities and on the world. So please don't forget to follow the links in the description and revisit some of my past videos which cover these topics in more depth. Hit like, subscribe to the channel, comment, and I'll see you next time. All the best.